So for our grand finale for this fall semester's Mind Technology and Society seminar series, we have Professor Russ McBride and want to <laughs> acknowledge that this series is supported by the um, generosity of the Glushko Samuelson Fund. And Professor McBride is one of our very own, he's um, Professor of Management right here at UC Merced, and he'll be presenting to us on deontic binding, imposed, voluntary, and autogenic. And thanks, Peter. I know we were all hoping to end the MTS series this semester with a bang, but alas, you guys are stuck with me today. Um, <clears throat> I know this was a this is a hard talk to start because I know there's a Guinness Book of World Records um, record waiting for me if I just gave the homeostatic mind talk one more time. <laughs> there's, there's some kind of record out there for someone having delivered the exact same talk to roughly the same group of people at the same university in the shortest amount of time, and I know I'm close to it, uh, but I'm going to resist that temptation and, as my Python said, talk about something completely different. Um, for those of you not familiar with me, I have uh, three research streams, which is at least two and a half too many. Um, I work on cognition, arc size stuff. I also work on social ontology stuff, the study of the structure of social reality. And then I work on some businessy stuff, entrepreneurship, management, strategy, uh, behavioral economics. Um, I also direct the social reality and cognition research group. Uh, if you're interested in participating or jumping on the advisory committee, send me an email. If you're on the advisory committee, there are deep and laborious obligations, including primarily talking to me for five minutes once a year or so. Um, and I cheated a little bit. I put a snapshot of the Tetons there instead of the Sierras. Uh, okay, so let's get to work. Um, my contribution today, <clears throat> and I apologize, I'm just getting over a cold. My contribution is relatively straightforward, I hope, and I think. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time than I normally would providing a background on social ontology and the social sciences in general. And then I'm going to dig into the standard model or the standard view in social ontology, the kind of majority view, before I talk about the taxonomy problem. The taxonomy of the problem is just the problem that we don't have a decent taxonomy of deontics yet. Uh, then I'm going to talk about my solution, which is simply that there are um, three ways of, instead of trying to figure out a decent taxonomy for deontics themselves, if we instead look at how deontics bind to people, um, we get this pretty neat three-part taxonomy, which is, is really useful in lots of ways, I think. Um, and then if we have time, I'm going to talk about what I call the autogenic paradox. Okay, so... <clears throat> A baseball team, uh, a C corporation, a marriage, a gang, a university, a restaurant, the U.S. Senate, uh, and the government of Poland are all examples of social phenomena. They're all around us. Social phenomena are arguably the most important aspects of our lives and capture the bulk of our attention and our efforts and our concerns every day. So we all work inside of some kind of social entity. Um, like a university or a firm, we utilize the services that such entities provide, like food from a grocery store or drive on roads uh, made possible or at least uh, run by the Department of Transportation. We socialize within social entities like uh, a birthday party or a dinner party or a bridge club, uh, and they structure the vast majority of our daily lives, unless you're living alone on a desert island, in which case you are not here listening to my talk. So, the fundamental question that social ontology is trying to answer is this question about what a social entity is. What is a university? What is a baseball team? What's a gang? What's a marriage? What's a government? What's a dinner party? Um, so unlike a lot of other fields that work in the social sciences, social ontology takes this question as primary. Right? Hence the ontology part of the name, social ontology, is trying to understand the structure of these social entities. Um, so you might ask, why didn't sociology tackle this question? Sociology has had 100 plus years to look at this question. Um, and I'm going to engage in a little historical speculation and suggest that Durkheim 
you know, along with Marx and, and Weber, but Durkheim especially was interested in establishing a field distinct and separate from psychology. And they were much more interested in doing that than they were in trying to tackle the fundamental question about what a social entity is. <clears throat> um, and indeed, um, even today, if you're a budding sociologist looking for a job, you're going to have a lot better chance getting a job if you are um, not looking at these kind of fundamental theoretical questions, and if you are instead you know, running regressions over empirically tractable variables. Um, you might also ask why institutional theory didn't answer this question. We've got a famous institutional scholar um, not too far away at Stanford. Um, the answer here is a lot more straightforward. Um, institutional theory is interested in the effects of institutions and social entities on individuals. It's kind of a, um, a one-way street, um, as it were, which makes it hard, actually, to answer questions about how individuals affect institutions or social entities. Um, but that's a separate issue. They're really, they take institutions as presumed, right? And they really just want to figure out how those institutions affect people and individual behavior. Uh, so you might also ask, why didn't economics tackle this question? Uh, and this slide might be a little bit shocking to you if you don't have friends who are economists or you haven't looked into this issue a lot. But, um, I mean, ideally we want economics to do what the physical sciences try to do, which is explain and predict, right? And prediction was given up pretty early in economics, right? It was just too hard. And, um, yeah, they failed too often, it's just too difficult. Uh, but economics still retain the goal of trying to offer realistic explanations of phenomena, and in particular economic activity. Um, but that goal ended in a series of debates where Milton Friedman, in a journal called the American Economic Review in the late 1940s, basically put a nail in that idea, in the coffin of that idea that the goal was to be really accurate and empirically tractable, right? So <clears throat> instead, he said, economists don't have to have necessarily realistic assumptions or accurately describe the phenomena. They just have to describe the behavior as if people were following, say, the model that I'm advancing, right? So it's, I mean, there were debates in cognitive science about uh, people catching baseballs and whether or not they actually ran these very complicated uh, formulae and their mathematical formulae in their head in order to figure out the trajectory of the baseball, to figure out where to move to catch it. And <clears throat> the economics, the economists, sorry, had kind of a similar version of that debate, but concluded, oh, I'm missing part of my slide, concluded um, with a normative conclusion that, hey, we don't really care Right? As long as people are engaged in an activity that <clears throat> could be described as if they were following these complicated calculations, that's good enough for us. So in the end, um, economics doesn't demand prediction nor realistic understanding of economic social phenomena, much less explanations of like what constitutes social entities themselves. So that was kind of a, a little side note, but an interesting one at least for me, um, because I couldn't figure out why um, they were doing what they were doing, and indeed, um, this was shocking to Richard Thaler, who recently got a Nobel Prize in economics, and really helped motivate a lot of the people like Thaler who uh, pursued and are pursuing behavioral economics as a way of um, providing more tractable, realistic, empirically accurate explanations of economic behavior. Um, so uh, Brian Epstein, who was here last semester, I think, um, in his book, The Ant Trap, which has gotten a lot of awards recently, said, hey, what's gone wrong with the theories and the social sciences? Why, despite the information revolution, this glut of information we have and things like social media uh, <clears throat> and digitization, are we not better off? Why don't we have better social theories? Right? And so for some, um, the social sciences are seen as something in kind of a free fall. Right, without a unified theoretical foundation, which we do have in the physical sciences. <clears throat> so social ontology is an exploding movement right now in philosophy and the social sciences. Um, we've got some books with social ontology in the title. We've got the journal of social ontology. 
Um, there are a number of research groups that are popping up around the world, including Tony Lawson's Cambridge Social Ontology Research Group. Tony, incidentally, talks a lot about the, uh, the modeling issue in economics. Uh, we've got the Berkeley Social Ontology Research Group, led by Jennifer Houghton and John Searle. Um, we've got the Finnish Center, where Raimo Tuomela is, and lots of other places popping up. Uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, big names include Michael Bratman at Stanford, uh, Margaret Gilbert at Irvine, Kirk Ludwig, who was here last semester, I think, and gave an MTS talk on climate change, not on social ontology, but he has a uh, two-part, uh, two-volume series of books on social ontology. Uh, Raimo Tuomela in Finland, uh, Philip Pettit and Christian List, um, Elizabeth Pachery uh, in Paris, who was also here last semester, um, and of course John Searle, who's seen kind of as the the founding father, even though he wasn't the first one uh, to the field. So um, the unstated grand ambition of sociology is to uh, provide a ultimately a unified theoretical foundation for all of the social sciences, economics, sociology, political science, social psychology, management, strategy, uh, etc. cetera. Right? Are they close to doing that? No. Will they ever do that? I don't know. But that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to find a unified theoretical framework. <clears throat> okay, so what do they think the answer to that question is about what a social entity is? Um, I'm gonna try and provide you kind of the majority view on this question, right? What is a university? What is a gang? What is a baseball team? Um, to do that, I have to step back a little bit and just mention some basics, which we're, we're all familiar with, namely um, the first point that humans have these radically frenetic, hyperactive cognitive systems, right? I don't think there's a whole lot of debate anymore that the big difference between humans and the rest of the animal kingdom is that we have a vastly more active, um, hyperactive cognitive system that allows us to do all sorts of stuff that <coughs> despite talk of apes learning sign language and things, vastly outstrip the rest of the animal kingdom. Right? So we can imagine all sorts of scenarios that are not actually present. We can run through possible scenarios so we don't have to test them out in the real world, which is highly costly. We can imagine future outcomes and possible states of the world, all sorts of stuff. And part and parcel of that is that we often attach invisible and sometimes impractical significance to things and people and events in all sorts of ways, right? So, a, yeah, go ahead. I'm just wondering what does impractical? Because I'm just thinking of a bunch of things that, like, on the surface, seem impractical, but actually have some other reason to. Be. Yeah, and so <clears throat> I'm speaking very broadly right now. But part of having a super frenetic, hyperactive cognitive system like we do means that we engage in really weird behaviors. Um, that other creatures do not engage in. Like it appears that, um, although some creatures show evidence of some kinds of neuroses and depression, we seem much more prone to it, right? Um, so that's kind of one example where things seem horrible or things seem bad when there's nothing there in the physical environment that necessarily implies that or shows that. Uh, but uh, for the sake of this talk, I'm really just talking about basic symbols, right? So. Um, we see a group of people, if you're part of a tribe, um, that, that tribe might be engaged in a dance which counts as asking the gods for rain, right? Or um, I've got this little piece of cloth, piece of paper in my pocket, which has all sorts of significance beyond regular pieces of paper, right? So I can go and trade this for a tasty burrito or a movie ticket or use it to pay for part of my rental car and do all sorts of things with it that I can't do with a regular piece of paper. It also has the regular physical properties of a piece of paper, so I can crumple it up or make a spitball or burn it or whatever. But because we attach this kind of weird significance to this piece of thing um, that other pieces of paper don't have, it has all sorts of special powers. The most of those that you describe seem like practical. Yeah, these are certainly practical and they provide lots of use in all sorts of ways. But as people become you know, there was lots of witch burning in Salem. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which these things go awry. I don't think the witch burning is super useful, although there might be an argument to suggest otherwise. Um, 
so sometimes it's it's useful and practical, and sometimes it's not useful and not practical. Most of the stuff I'm talking about is going to be practical stuff. Okay. So, um, Rose Franklin Delano Roosevelt saying, "I hereby declare a state of war to exist between the United States and the Empire of Japan." had an incredible amount of significance that affected millions of people's lives, and millions of other people died, and the country's boundaries were rewritten in huge, huge effects, right? Because of what we attached to that declaration. Uh, this is Nastya Luikin, the 2008 Olympic champion, engaged in a series of behaviors that counts as not going to the 2012 London Olympics. We attach a certain significance to that particular behavior pattern, which she probably did not want. So <clears throat> when we um, attach significance to certain things and we do so en masse and establish a collective agreement, <clears throat> then we start coming close to um, establishing social phenomena. So social ontology, for the most part, advocates kind of a collective agreement approach, which goes back at least to Aristotle, <clears throat> such that, for example, if enough people collectively agree or collectively believe that you can treat a rock as if it were a pet, um, you can actually start selling pet rocks to people and make real money. Right? I find that bizarre. Um, but <clears throat> similarly, you know, lots of tribes use seashells as uh, currency, right? just the way that we use regular US bills as currency. Okay, So what do we collectively agree upon? Um, on Searle's account, what we're collectively agreeing upon is a status function, that is we accept that X counts as Y and C, where for a $10 bill, uh, X is a piece of paper with certain text printed by a certain organization, the Department of Bureau, uh, the Bureau of Engraving, uh, and that counts as currency that can be used transactions. And what we're really establishing when we collectively agree upon a particular status function are rights and duties for the people that are affected by such things, right? So we imagine that someone has rights or duties that they do not inherently have. So as the rightful owner of this $10 bill, I have a collection of rights and duties. There are not many duties, actually. I just by law, I'm not supposed to burn it or otherwise destroy it. Uh, but I have lots of rights attached to that. And all the rights I get by exchanging this for lots of other stuff. Yeah? On the previous slide, on the slide, you use the word imagine? Sorry, all I hear is fan up here. On, on both of the last two slides, you use the word imagine or imaginary. Is yeah. That important? Do you, do you think that it's important that this is, uh, that there's a distinction between like the intrinsic properties of things versus uh, the social properties of things? I do, yeah. And I've actually um, got some stuff in print where I argue pretty aggressively for a distinction between the physical world and the social world. I think we only live in one world, right? But there's a physical aspect and there's a social aspect. And it's really important to make those, it's really important to make that distinction because a, a lot of people are using a lot of different tools that are appropriate for studying the physical world and trying to apply them to the social world and it doesn't work. And a lot of people are <coughs> um, getting confused and thinking that uh, you can treat social objects as if they're physical objects. Um, this is a long, important discussion, but um, if you treat social objects as if they were physical objects, and they are similar in the sense that a lot of them are outside of our voluntary control, right? like it doesn't make a difference um, what I think about the US government by and large. I can have some limited effect here and there around the edges. It's going to keep existing and go on doing what it's doing. Right? Um, it doesn't make a difference if I think that my bank account has like 10 extra zeros at the end of it. Um, the bank manager and the bank employees are going to have a very different opinion and they're not going to be too interested in hearing my contrary opinion. Um, so this idea that at the base of any kind of social entity lies a collection of rights and duties uh, is not really ex made explicitly very often, but I refer to this as the deontological thesis, right? That social reality is fundamentally composed of deontology, rights, duties, authorizations, permissions, etc. 
Um, and arguably, most people doing work in social ontology subscribe to the deontological thesis. One notable exception is Michael Bratman at Stanford. But on this view, that means that social reality is a vast interconnected web of deontic powers, of essentially rights and duties. And that also implies that if you look at any social entity, you can ultimately, if you want to understand that social entity, um, decompose it into the idiosyncratic rights and duties that comprise it. So you want to understand what a cocktail party is, or the Polish government, or a soccer, soccer team, or a faculty meeting. You start looking at the rights and duties that are inherent in the roles that those people are occupying, and you get a good description of what constitutes that social entity. Uh, so what do I mean by this, this term deontics, right, or deontic powers? Um, I divide them up into positive powers, what I just call rights for shorthand, um, including rights, authorizations, permissions, uh, <coughs> commands or orders or duties on the other hand, including requirements, commitments, and obligations. I don't have a nice um, definition or complete list of these, which is part of the problem I'm going to get to. Okay, and by the way, so I'm, I'm kind of hitting you guys with a lot of stuff. This is a broad introduction to the basics of social ontology, so I want to dig into one example, the example of a marriage, uh, to understand how that's created and how what it's constituted by, at least from the perspective of Searle and someone like Kurt Ludwig. So when you're creating a marriage, you have to have some standing status function, X counts as Y and C. In this case, an officiator issuing the proper declaration counts as creating a marriage between two people in the proper context, where X is the officiator directing a marriage ceremony, Y is the bringing about of a marriage into existence, and C is the appropriate context with all its details. So there is collective acceptance that an officiator has the authority to create a marriage. Right? And that authority, say a minister says, I hereby declare, I hereby pronounce you husband and wife, and seemingly by magic, a new chunk of social reality comes into existence, a marriage that did not exist before he or she completed that sentence. Okay, so where does the minister's magic power come from? It comes from the deontic power that he possesses as part of his role as minister. So if a mailman stepped up at the last minute and chloroformed him and then pushed him over and issued the same words, it wouldn't work, right? If the barista from Starbucks came up and issued the same words um, after stripping off his clothing and putting on his same clothing, it wouldn't work, right? Because the deontic powers are associated with that particular person, right? It's not the words, it's the powers that that minister has. And what comes into existence when a new marriage comes into existence? New duties and rights. Because like any social entity, that social entity is comprised of rights and duties. So what are they? Well, I don't know if I can list them all, but um, some of the new rights include, you know, marital tax deduction, social security benefits, um, you know, group membership discounts, um, and some of the duties include um, the obligation to make next of kin decisions should your partner fall under some kind of medical emergency. Um, you're subject to joint financial debt. Uh, for your joint accounts, if you live in an urban area of China, you're obligated not to birth more than one child, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so that's what distinguishes a man from a husband, right? The husband has a collection of rights and duties that a, an unmarried man does not have. You know, what distinguishes an employee from a fired employee? So if I take a job at Google, right, I sign an employee contract, and that employee contract attempts to specify a large collection of rights and duties. A lot of other rights and duties remain unspecified, and I encounter kind of, you know, seemingly accidentally as I'm going through my workday, and the boss tells me to do a bunch of stuff. All right, but some of those duties might include things like uh, being required to do a bunch of Java programming, uh, being you know, obligated to keep the mail server running, being obligated to go to meetings, and so on and so forth. And some of the rights include uh, the right to eat as much free food in the Google cafeteria as I want, the right to take naps in those cool little Google napping pods they have in the hallways, and probably most importantly, the right to receive a paycheck every two weeks, right? So it's, it's the rights and duties on this view 
that are critical and that compromise these chunks of social reality. So if you think of that minister saying, I hereby declare you husband and wife, that declaration, that declarative speech act is kind of a magic wand that magically creates these chunks of reality. So this would be like if Harry Potter could only use his wand in circumstances where everybody agreed he could use it, there was collective agreement, they agreed about what kind of magic it caused, and that magic couldn't alter physical reality. Now, if you believe that the Declarative Speech Act um, is required for the creation of any chunk of social reality, then you agree with what I refer to as the pan-declarative thesis, that the deontics of social reality are, without exception, created by the declarative. This is an incredibly strong claim. Um, I think it's too strong. <clears throat> right? But Searle says, all institutional facts and therefore all status functions are created by speech acts of the type that in 1975, I was working way back in 1975, and I baptized as declarations. <clears throat> okay, now I try to do my Searle impersonation, but if you just imagine like Howard Cosell saying this, that's, it's pretty similar. So I can't fix the roof by saying I fix the roof, and I can't fry an egg by saying I fry an egg but I can promise to come see you by saying, I promise to come see you, and I can order you to leave the room by saying, I order you to leave the room. And I can marry you if I'm a minister by saying, I hereby declare you married. Right? I can create a state of war for our country by saying, I hereby declare a state of war if I'm the president and I get congressional approval. Okay, so with these speech acts, I can do very interesting things like magically create things that didn't exist before. I can create promises, I can create orders, and with a declarative, I can create new chunks of actual social reality. So, um, this is a lot of stuff, but basically, um, in review, collective recognition of status functions, right, is required that describes certain deontic powers. Those deontic powers essentially constitute every social entity, that's the deontological thesis, and deontic powers are always created via a declarative speech act, at least if you're Searle or Ludwig, that's the pan-declarative. Thesis. Um, let's see, is Paul, Paul's not here. Okay, so I'm gonna skip. Uh, I'll mention one of these implications. So <clears throat> there are a lot of modeling tools um, for the social out there. Um, NetLogo, for example, lots of other stuff. Um, one of the implications of this, if the deontological thesis is correct and all social reality is ultimately constituted by deontics, means that the modeling tools we use that don't include deontics, that don't include a way of tracking rights and duties, uh, are not going to be accurately modeling social okay, that's, that's one implication. I'll we'll skip the others. Okay, so that was the, the kind of large background I wanted to, to get out before I, I talk about my specific contribution. Uh, the first is the problem, right? The problem is very simple, it's just that we don't have a taxonomy of deontics, okay? Or as Searle says, we do not have a taxonomy of status functions that I find satisfactory. Uh, I worked on this for a while and I couldn't really get anywhere. Uh, I mean, yeah, there are these things we call obligations, and yeah, there are these things we call duties, but other than kind of a flat-footed, you know, describing of some of these things. There wasn't anything useful I came up with. Um, Searle apparently didn't have any luck either. For a while he was talking about the distinction between um, deontics that have some kind of physical symbolism attached to it, like a driver's license that symbolizes that you have rights and duties associated to a driver who's passed a certain exam, etc. cetera. Um, but that's not very useful either. So my suggestion in the end, um, which I think is somewhat useful, is that if we instead think about the types of deontics that exist, um, we think about the ways in which those rights and duties, those deontics, bind to an individual, then we get a nice first cut um, into three different categories um, which are helpful. Okay, and, and the three categories are those deontics that are imposed upon you from an external source, those that you voluntarily accept from an external source, and those that you create yourself. Right. So, the first distinction 
is one between imposed deontics and voluntary deontics. So what the heck am I talking about? Well, here are some imposed deontics. Right, so we've got a parking ticket. Right? I generally do not want a parking ticket. Maybe you're different, I don't know. Um, but that is imposed upon me. Right? And when I lawfully receive a parking ticket, I have a collection of duties that are imposed upon me whether I want them or not. So I'm obligated to pay a fine. If I don't pay the fine, then I'm obligated to pay a bigger fine. If I don't do that, then I'm obligated to forfeit my license and so on and so forth. All right. Similarly with um, a military draft, right? that is imposed upon you whether you want it or not from an external source, typically the federal government. Um, eminent domain. Um, we don't live in China, but if you live in China and the government wants to build a freeway through your house, you better say goodbye to your house. Um, because they don't care if you want to continue living in your house or not. They will tear your house down with you in it or with you out of it and they will build the freeway. All right, because they have eminent domain. Right, demands from your employer, tax code changes. Um, merely by living, by occupying space in a certain <coughs> geographical portion of the world, I'm subject to a huge compendium of civil and criminal codes, only a tiny, tiny bit of which I have the vaguest idea. So I'm pretty sure I can't uh, murder somebody because I don't like their hair color or take their car because their car is prettier than mine. But beyond that, I really I don't know much about our legal code. But that is no excuse in the eyes of the law. I'm subject to all the criminal and civil codes, regardless whether I'm aware of them or not. And if I violate them, and I am found out, I will have another collection of duties imposed upon me. So in contrast to the imposed deontics, we have voluntary deontics, right? like a marriage. So we forget sometimes, but before the minister says, I hereby declare you husband and wife, or husband and husband, or wife and wife, <coughs> the minister says, um, do you so-and-so take this person to be your lawfully wedded husband or wife? Right? And then you voluntarily accept, or you don't, in which case something's gone awry somewhere and you shouldn't have had that ceremony. <coughs> but um, the minister is asking for your voluntary agreement, right? Because it is a voluntary collection of deontics that you are ultimately agreeing to. Just like an inheritance, you don't have to accept, accept an inheritance, as I think Spinoza did not. Is that correct, Spinoza? I think Sp Spinoza declined his inheritance. Um, it is something you can voluntarily, you voluntarily accept or voluntarily reject. You don't have to accept an offer of employment. It's a, it's a voluntary acceptance, right? Um, I was offered the chance to deliver a talk, which for me was an honor, but I don't have to voluntarily accept it, right? So there's a large collection of deontics <coughs> that you have a choice about whether or not to accept, right? Versus the imposed deontics about which you do not have a choice. So that's, that's all the distinction amounts to. But within the category of voluntary deontics, there are those deontics that are sourced externally and there are those that are self-created. And we've mostly been talking about just the externally sourced ones because those are the ones that are most interesting. Um, they're typically the biggest and the most powerful, right? <clears throat> so like marriage, um, you do not create the institution of marriage, you are partaking in the institution of marriage, but it existed long before you. The inheritance is not yours, it's something you're receiving from someone else, otherwise it wouldn't be called an inheritance. Um, Google is able to offer me uh, an employment contract because they have the money and the infrastructure to do so, and they're offering it to me, right? <clears throat> and so on and so forth. But there is this often overlooked category of um, deontics that are autogenically created, that are self-created, right? So if I decide, decide to start a uh, <clears throat> bird of the week bird watching club, Right? No, one's, no one's imposing that upon me. No one is providing me the opportunity to do that if I'm doing it myself. Right? I am taking it upon myself to do that. So I am taking it upon myself to um, accept a collection of duties. Right? Some of those duties might include uh, researching birds in the area, organizing bird walks, organizing meetings to talk about birds, and, and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, Wendy Cobb started Teach Across America, or Teach for America, 
I think, um, <clears throat> when she was, I think, a master student at Princeton. She wanted to improve the quality of education in America. No one told her she had to do that. No one gave her the opportunity to do that. Uh, she had to build it up from scratch herself. She had to recruit people into her vision, um, <clears throat> help train teachers, help find schools that might be open to the idea, and so on and so forth. So these, these were duties that she created herself and voluntarily accepted herself. So the, the three-part distinction <clears throat> overall then looks like this. Um, we've got imposed deontics on the left, and we've got voluntary deontics on the right. Imposed deontics, things like parking tickets, criminal code, military draft. Um, the voluntarily externally sourced ones are things like marriage, you know, inheritance, an offer of employment, and so on. Uh, but we also got this funny little category, these voluntary autogenic, right, self-sourced deontics, where I'm taking it upon myself to start, you know, a bird of the week club. Or Wendy Cop <clears throat> took it upon herself to start um, an institution that would improve the quality of education in K through 12 in America, or any kind of company, right, that started with a, some individuals as opposed to inside another company, right? So Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, uh, or say um, you're worried about the little kids running across the street and getting mowed over by a semi near your house, and so you take it upon yourself to put on a fluorescent jacket and hold up signs telling the cars to stop. Um, so that they can cross safely. You take upon yourself to um, <clears throat> handle the duty of performing crosswalk guard services. No one tells you to do it, no one asks you to do it, no one provides you know, the fluorescent jacket, you have to go buy one, you do it all yourself. Right. So that's a, a self-assigned duty. Okay, so I think this is pretty, uh, a pretty simple distinction, but it's, it's quite useful. Um, so this autogenic category, which is often overlooked, fits neatly into this three-part taxonomy that tightly integrates with the rest of the theoretical framework in social ontology. Um, I'm not going to discuss corner cases, <coughs> but there are plenty. Um, so we have a problem now, however. Uh, if you believe in the deontological thesis that social reality fundamentally rests on deontology, rights, duties, permissions, authorizations, etc., and you believe the very strong pan-declarative thesis that the deontics of social reality are, without exception, created by the Declaration, as Searle and Kirk Ludwig believe, then social reality fundamentally rests on the declarative. What's the, the problem? The problem is that it doesn't seem to work. Right, so if I stand up here and I say, I hereby declare myself the king of England, that's not gonna be super effective. Uh, it might shock you to learn that I won't actually become the king of England, right? <clears throat> but now we have an interesting reason to explain that. And the reason is that the Declarative Speech Act seems to work in cases where we have imposed deontics and in cases where we have uh, <clears throat> voluntary externally sourced deontics. Because in those cases, we have pre-existing deontic power. If you lack deontic power, you will not be able to successfully issue a declarative. Right? So in these cases, there's pre-existing deontic power. By definition, because you're creating the deontics yourself, there is no pre-existing deontic power. But that also means that you can't issue a declarative which requires pre-existing deontic power for it to be successful. Okay. So, are all bits of social reality really created by the declaratives? The pan-declarative thesis, correct. And I think it is not. So, I like I've got a picture of, that's, I think that's Searle and I at Kirk Ludwig's house in Indiana. Um, <clears throat> Contra Searle, the declarative cannot explain every case of social creation. In fact, it cannot explain the creation of an entire category of social entities, those self-created autogenic social entities, right? Like a bird watching club, or a nonprofit, or a startup, or someone who takes, takes it upon themselves to perform guard crossing duties. Right? So it's not just that it doesn't work, but it doesn't work in a specific category, which I think is an important um, realization. So compare Roosevelt's proclamation, right? his declaration that 
Um, there now exists a state of war between the United States and the Empire of Japan. That was a successful declaration. But that worked because there was a very large um, collection of Deontic powers that he possessed by virtue of the fact that he occupied a role as a president of the United States. So if the mayor of Topeka, Kansas issued the same words, it wouldn't work. Right? Similarly to if the barista knocks over the minister and tries to declare um, a marriage into existence, it's not going to work. Right? And compare that to the case of Wendy Kopp starting Teach for America. Right? This was an emergent organization that she started herself. Right? There's no declarative to be found anywhere. So if Teach for America didn't arrive into existence fully formed simply from a single godlike declarative speech act that emerged like most self-organized social entities from nothing more than the germ of an idea and discussions as she began to enroll people in her vision, um, build institutional partners, garner more resources, um, and build out the institution strand by strand. Right? So slowly she built connections into the relevant parts of the social world motivating people to work for her, eliciting commitments from friends and strangers. It was a long, slow, gradual, uphill slog. Yeah? You can come to the declarative where she assigns herself the role of CEO and founder and all of that. You wouldn't count that as a declarative? Her assigning herself the role of founder and all of that? Um, she can do that. It just, it's not a declarative that brings about the existence of Teach for America. Um, it's rather a declarative that, um, I mean, it's hard to call it a declarative, but we can call it a declarative where she assigns herself certain duties. Yeah. If it's okay to do these kind of questions at this point. Sure. Um, following up on that, uh, yeah. very much what I was thinking. It seems to me that you could, you could imagine this as a cloud of declaratives. Um, in terms of the minutiae of creating Teach for America. I will, I agree to be a volunteer at this time and date and so forth. And that Teach for America emerges from this cloud of declaratives, although no one magic bullet declarative can do so. Would yep. that be something that, that would resurrect the, 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 the point of view that John Searle has? Yeah, so I don't, did, did you pass uh, my paper out to everybody or just the grad students? Um, actually, I don't, you didn't send me Oh, <laughs> well then I guess nobody got my paper. Um, okay, so in the in the paper I discuss options for people who want to retain the pan declarative. Um, one is to limit its purview, but still retain the idea that a single declarative brings into existence in toto a social entity, right? And what you're arguing is the other option, I think, that's available to those people who want to retain the pan declarative, which is to say, hey, you know, there doesn't have to be a single declarative that magically brings about the existence of the entire organization, but we're still committed to the declarative. It's just that there are like thousands of little tiny ones that kind of add up. And so I think that's a reasonable a reasonable move and argument to do that. Yeah? It wouldn't fit with this idea that as you gain more agency because the roles that you're assigned within these social scenarios, let's say, are all linking up towards this this idea of either the positive uh, downtick point of view or the rights or the duties. And so as you're going as an agent in the world and you're participating socially, the roles that you're committing to in a given scenario sort of link up into a more general space of right versus duty and that comes out in the wash because if a Starbucks employee what do you mean it comes is out in the wash? also a minister, an ordained minister, then they can pronounce me a uh, husband and wife or a husband and husband or whatever. <clears throat> it's just that you're only recognizing the the coffee rule, the coffee, the barista rule, not the ordained minister rule. So yeah, I mean, it turns out if you so you can get online and go to universallifechurch.com. I think, and for $9.99, you can become a minister that can <coughs> declare people married. Um, so it doesn't take much. Right? But I think I'm missing... So at one point you said some stuff washes out. I didn't quite understand what you meant by that. So the idea is that... What seems to be your idea is that 
as as movers in the world, we we engage in social activities where we're assigned different roles. Either we're we're an agent who has rights and duties, or or we're an agent that has rights, or an agent that has duties and responsibilities. Like if I have a driver's license, that's a right, and it's also a duty to uphold. Like it's a different type of social contract because they're different semantic frames. And so both of those roles are still assigned. It's just yeah. whatever's in focus in a given scenario. Yeah. You get these different, these, this try whatever thing that you have going on. But it's very much an aggregation of, of roles as being one thing or another that comes sort of to fruition, whether or not you can be realized as an ordained minister or realized as somebody that can marry someone. I mean, if you have a thick group of people that believe that they want you to marry them, it has no, no difference if you're an ordained minister or not. They can believe that you guys are together because in that little community, you have been assigned, you have been given a that yeah. responsibility, and that has nothing to do with this old idea about speech acts and like you have to have like, or typically you have to have these things in order, but you don't necessarily have to have them. Yeah, so that nothing in that um, is in conflict with any of this stuff, really. So the only the only difference is like, so if, if I join a cult, say, and the cult marries us, mm -hmm. um, I am married within that cult. Um, the only trouble, and I'm, the reason I'm married within that cult is because that's what counts as being married inside that cult, right? So you have all the basic elements, right? You have um, collective acceptance. So that cult, that group of people collectively accepts that that's what counts as marriage. You have probably some kind of um, process for doing so, right? You guys both hold up particular leaves from a tree, and that counts as you know, being married or something. Um, and so, in that society, X counts as Y and C. That is, holding up those particular leaves counts as being married within that particular group of people. The only problem is that if you go out into the non-cult world, then according to that world, you're not married, right? Because that community collectively accepts something else that counts as marriage. Um, so there's nothing, I don't think there's anything in conflict with that story. Um, there is, I mean, these rights and duties do accrete, they're hierarchical in certain ways, they blend, the boundaries are unclear in lots of ways. So it's, um, there are a lot of, it's easy to come up with borderline cases, I think. Um, can somebody else have a question? Yeah. So help me see how this, is it in some ways circular? So is it circular? my rights and duties uh -huh. are things that are relative to a particular community or a particular social entity, um, how is it that I'm going to explain what a social entity is in terms of rights and duties? Right? They're, they're, what, what's the foundation? What, I mean, it seems like you're defining rights and duties in terms of, or at least some component of them, in terms of the very social entities that you're trying to eventually define. Um, there's certainly some cases where those will be, well, it's not really self-referential, but it's more of a part-whole reference. Because um, certainly some rights are gonna refer to rights in the scope of other social entities, right? And the social entities are comprised of rights and duties themselves. So, yes, that is certainly correct. Um, is it circular? Um, I don't, I mean, I don't think it's circular because um, it's a pretty, I mean, it's a pretty individualistic psychological account, right? <clears throat> so in the actual mind of any given person, there are a collection of beliefs. Those beliefs include things like um, that person moving in such and such a way when that particular thing that we call a stoplight has a particular color counts as running a red light, which is in violation of our you know, social order. Right? <clears throat> um, and so it grounds out in the individual cognitive activities of individual people. So the empirical story um, is a very kind of straightforward foundational story. Conceptually, well, 
But yeah, I mean, there, there is going to be a lot of, you know, when you're understanding what a right is, referring to all sorts of other social entities for sure. So I guess in that sense, it's maybe coming close to being circular. I see, I see where you're getting at. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so in this case with Wendy Kopp, right, what did not happen is that she did not wake up one day and say, I hereby declare the existence of an organization to advance the quality of teaching in America, and magically that organization came into existence. There are a lot of little things she did which eventually accreted into an organization as we know it. Sorry, but that's the same if I were the President of the United States and I declare war on another country. There are lots of other social contracts that have to be in place for that to work. Yeah. Now that we're challenging all that today, but I'm saying if I were the President of the United States and I declare war, it means that so many of these other things have to line up. It's not like Wendy Cobb getting up in the morning saying, I'm going to start this organization. Yeah. That organization will only happen if so many other things kind of fall in place, right? Yeah. So how is that different from the declarative position? I wonder. So I think it's I think it's the same. Once Wendy Cop has an existing organization called Teach for America, as she does now, of which she is the director, and she can say, I hereby order you to, you know, fly out to. Virginia and talk to the public schools there and set up a bunch of contracts, blah, blah, blah. I hereby declare that we have to do this, that, and the other thing. So, she, so it's, very, it's very similar because at this point she has amassed a large collection of deontic power. Right? But in the beginning, there was nothing there. She had no deontic power. Right? She couldn't issue a declarative of any interest because it simply wouldn't have an effect because she didn't have that power. Now the president took a long time to become president, and there are lots of things he did, but once he occupied that role, he had a vast collection of deontic powers, right, in which he could issue very interesting declaratives, like declaring war, declaring executive orders, and all sorts of stuff. But um, without that pre-existing institution there, that, that deontic power doesn't exist. And so the question I'm, I'm really interested in is, well, how do you get to the point where you actually have a lot of Deontic power, right? When you have none to begin with. And if the account that Searle and Ludwig are telling um, is correct, then there should be a declarative, right? Wendy Cox should have had some kind of declarative there that brought about the existence of that organization. And we don't see that, right? We see people doing different stuff. And I was gonna skip the autogenic paradox, but you guys are all asking questions that are relating to the autogenic paradox, so I'm gonna jump into that in a second. But feel free if you have a oh, wait a little bit. Okay. Um, so this this case of Wendy Cobb or starting a uh, guard crosswalk service or starting a new business or starting an organized crime ring, I think <clears throat> starting a neighborhood watch group or as Margaret Gilbert discusses in great detail in an awesome paper, um, discussing uh, two people walking together, what does it mean to walk together? Um, it doesn't seem like this is an isolated case. There's a large collection of events that fall into this autogenic <coughs> category. Yeah. And it seems like Stroll's account doesn't really apply super well there. If it does apply, it's going to require a lot of rejiggering. Right? So the entrepreneurial startup, pre Ink Apple, Wendy Cops Teach Across America, Billy Bob's Food of the Week Club. These are all cases that seem to tell against the pan part of the pan declarative thesis. Why is that? Well, because all interesting chunks of social reality created by a declarative are created by people with pre-existing roles, with pre-existing deontic power, right? And powerful declaratives are made possible only by means of some position of power, right? And why does it fail for the autogenic category? Because when starting from scratch, one doesn't have enough social powers to create an interesting chunk of social reality merely by verbal command. Right? And there's a broader picture here whereby I think Searle's model works well for formal social structures, but it doesn't seem to work as well for informal social structures. And that's precisely what we're dealing with when we're dealing with autogenic categories. Wendy Kopp didn't yet have an organization called Teach for America. So um, there's only one uh, main objection I've received so far from this stuff, and I've actually presented it at Berkeley to Searle 
and Jennifer Houghton and other people. Um, and that is that this is merely a ripoff of some guy who did some legal work named Von Wright in 1997, who talked about a distinction between heterogeneous norms, norms given to somebody else, and autonomous norms, norms given to oneself. And certainly autonomous norms sound a lot like my autogenic deontics category. Um, so my response, one, um, that's a three-part distinction that I have. He's talking about a two-part distinction. Uh, two, the autonomous norms for von Wright are not really, they're not real norms, they're not a real class. Uh, whereas for me, the autogenic, the optics form a real category. But most importantly, within his heteronymous norms, there's no means of distinguishing between imposed versus those that are voluntarily accepted. And I think that's uh, absolutely critical to really understanding these things. Uh, so I'm going to jump into this dangling mystery, which is how does an autogenic agent bind deontic powers to herself that she doesn't possess? There's nothing there to bind to herself. So how does she bind anything to herself? And I call this the, the autogenic paradox. Um, how does one create an institution out of thin air? How does one accumulate deontic power right, that comprises eventually the powers that the Tim Cook has, or, or rather Steve Jobs has, right? or the founder of the Bird of the Week Club? Right? You might think that you can just assume rights and duties. That don't work so well. Um, try walking up to a stranger on the street and ordering them to get you a sandwich. Right? It doesn't work so well. It doesn't work so well because um, they do not perceive you as having the right to give them an order to get a sandwich for them. Right? But there's an interesting there's an interesting phenomena that occurs, and there's a study beyond this which I failed to reference, but there are a lot of studies that are similar to this. Um, so imagine two siblings, right? And they're both sitting on the couch watching TV, and one says, hey, get me a cookie. Right? The success rate for that is typically quite low, or at least it was among my siblings. Um, <clears throat> they are not inclined to see a fellow sibling as having the right to give them an order very readily. But now imagine a different scenario, one where one of the siblings is attempting to clean or vacuum the house or something, and issues the order, hey, move the chair. Right? Move the chair so I can get the the vacuum cleaner over that spot. Um, many siblings will say, hey, screw you. I'm playing Xbox 360 or whatever. But many will say, OK, you know, and help you out. And the command will be successful. Right? Or at least it will be much more likely to be successful than the, hey, get me a cookie. Right? And I think that's critically important and interesting evidence. And what I'm going to claim is that it's interesting evidence because the way out of the autogenic paradox is duties first, or what I call the duties first guideline. You must assume duties first, not rights. Because it doesn't work if you assume rights first. Right? The absorption of duties provides evidence that you're willing to accept the deontic powers in toto and not merely attempting to dominate by assuming rights. Uh, the performance of those duties that are part of a role triggers association with the entire role itself, which includes rights, right? but you've got to be convincing in your assumption of that role. So, right. Any social role carries with it a collection of rights and duties. Building a business requires solving an extraordinary number of puzzling tasks. Starting a bird of the week club requires doing a bunch of lay work and organizing meetings and things like that. To create any kind of social institution um, and your role in it, you must assume that role, but you must assume the duties first. So the basic idea here is that any role, say the director of an institution to improve education in America, includes both duties and rights. Right? Um, if you start by assuming the duties, okay, and you are committed to them and you show that you're committed to them and achieve some traction in achieving them, people will eventually treat you as legitimately entitled to the entire 
role. So in Wendy Kopp's case, um, she assumed the role of a director of an institution to improve education in America. <clears throat> she had no powers whatsoever. She couldn't order anybody to do anything. Um, she had nobody working with her. There was no one to order. Ordering a stranger doesn't work. Um, she couldn't you know, engage in any kind of contracts with any of the public schools. She had nothing, right? But she kept working at it. She built a proposal as part of her master's thesis. She went to um, various meetings and gave presentations. Some people thought the idea was cool and started helping her out a little bit. She was able to issue minor orders. Hey, send that form to so-and-so so they can look at it, get us feedback, get feedback to us. She applied for grants. She eventually got uh, Union Carbide, I think it was, to give her like $26,000 and some office space uh, where she could continue working on this stuff. And at that point, she had a few rights. Okay, but she only had those rights because she assumed the duties first. She assumed the duties of someone who was attempting to build an organization <coughs> that improved education in America. Right? And if you start looking at a lot of these cases, like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak starting Apple, um, you hear a lot of stories about, say, Jobs' famous reality distortion field, his incredible powers of persuasion, and his you know charisma and stuff. But if the kind of story that I think might be more plausible is on track, then we should see evidence that Steve and Steve took on an incredible number of duties, especially in the early stages when they had no deontic powers. <clears throat> and we actually get that kind of story from people like Ronald Wayne. So Ronald Wayne was the third partner in Apple, everybody forgets about, and he sold his stock uh, for 800 bucks, which is now worth probably closer to $50 billion. And the quote is, Wayne had stated that he does not regret selling his stock um, as he made the best decision with the information available to me at the time. I was getting too old and those two were like whirlwinds. It was like having a tiger by the tail and I couldn't keep up with these guys. So that is, you know, <laughs> code for these guys were doing an incredible amount of work. They assumed an incredible number of duties and they were attempting to execute those duties. They were building circuit boards. They were trying to sell them to the local bite store in Palo Alto. They were trying to manufacture these things. They were getting friends to help them on the, on the premise of paying those friends at some point in the future, they hoped, and so on and so forth. Right, so the, my suggestion is that the way out of the autogenic paradox, how do you um, get deontic powers when you have none is by assuming the duties first, right? The duties that are part of some particular deontic role, which also includes rights, and eventually you start getting the rights as well. So Wendy Kopp assumed the duties of being the director of an institution to help uh, improve education, and eventually she not only had those duties, but she started getting rights as well. She can start issuing a few orders to the people who are helping her work. She got a little bit of money, she got a bigger grant, she was able to engage in contracts, you know, establish a nonprofit, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> okay. Um, so time is not too bad. That's all I have to say. Thanks.